Welcome to the Hill Baptist Church, everyone. I'm glad you are gathering with us this morning to worship the Lord together. Um, our mission is simple. It's to love God, love people, and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And if you are new with us this morning, I have a few things for you. Uh, the first is to text the word Hill Guest to 313131. And you'll receive a link and you can explore our website and uh, give us some more information if you'd like us to tell you more about our church family and what's going on. Uh, the second thing is you can join our email list. We send out a weekly email uh, with all the information you need to connect with the different things that we're doing. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page and on the right hand side, uh, click on the tab that says email sign up. You can also do that through our website, thehillbaptist.com and uh, love to get that information from you so we can keep you up to date on everything that is going on. Also, don't forget that we gather online on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, for Bible study for the adults and our youth gather at 7.30. And then Sunday morning, we also gather at 10 a.m. online for our small group Bible study time in Sunday school. So I'd love to have you join us for that. Uh, and also, too, I just want to thank you for your continued generosity to our church uh, we've been able to cover all our expenses in March and April, and that's just a testimony to your generosity and the fact that we are trusting God together for Him to provide for us, not only as families and individually, but also as a church family. And so thank you for your generosity. And I want to encourage you just to continue to worship the Lord through your giving. And you can do that by mailing in your offering uh, to the church office or dropping it by the drop box. And you can also give online at thehillbaptist.com backslash give. Or you can go to uh, thehillbaptist.com and click on Give in the top right-hand corner, and that'll walk you through it. It's really simple. Uh, but I encourage you to keep investing in the mission of the church. Uh, and also, too, I have some good news. You know, we've been raising money for our uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering, and this missions offering uh, goes to support missions in North America. Every dollar you give goes towards that missions uh, emphasis, and our goal uh, is $2,500 and the good news is we have met our goal and not only have we met our goal but we've exceeded our goal by over a thousand dollars so thank you for your generosity uh, even during this unique season uh, that we're in and uh, speaking of that unique season I want to give you a little bit of an update on just where we are as a church in our reopening plans I met with the deacons this past week and we've talked about what this could look like for us to reopen our church facilities and I don't have a date for you yet, uh, but I hope to have that in the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to meet again on Monday, um, May the 11th, and reevaluate things and try to set a target date. Uh, but whatever date that may be, we're going we're gonna to roll this out in phases, and so we'll introduce things one by one. And so thank you for your patience. I know if you're like me, you're just ready to meet together in person, uh, and we are all ready to do that, but we want to do it safely. And so that will be coming soon, that news uh, of when that will happen and what that will look like. But in the meantime, just pray for us. Pray for wisdom as we try to work out all those details in a way that is just honoring to the Lord and safe for everyone who will participate. And uh, lastly, I just want to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together as we begin this time of worship and lift our eyes to Him. And uh, let's do that right now in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for who you are. Uh, we know that you are a loving God. We know that you are good. Uh, we know that you are holy, that you are just, that you are merciful, uh, that your love never ends, um, and that you've extended your grace to us, and we are so grateful for that. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for the Spirit. We thank you for your people. Uh, we thank you that you've given us a mission we thank you for this opportunity to worship, uh, and we pray during this time that you would bring about change in our lives, help us to become the people you want us to be as we turn our eyes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning as we start our worship and song together, let us, uh, our hearts and our minds, lift up this prayer from Isaiah 25.1. It says, praise I will praise the Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Our first hymn echoes that, and I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my Lord. 
Let us sing all stanzas. I'm happy, oh wondrous account. My joys are immortal, I stand on the mount. I gaze on my treasure and long to be there with Jesus and angels and kindred so fair. Oh, Jesus, my Savior, with thee I am blessed. My life and salvation, my joy and my rest. Thy name be my throne, and thy love be my song. Thy grace shall inspire both my heart and my tongue. All who's like my Savior, he Salem's a bright king. He smiles and he loves me and helps me to sing. I'll praise him, I'll praise him with notes loud and clear. While rivers of pleasure my spirit shall cheer. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason to together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So with the assurance that God's forgiveness is possible through Jesus Christ, let us draw near to God and confess our sins to him thanking Him for His forgiveness that comes through Christ, asking Him to bring about the change He wants to see in our lives. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue our worship together through song, let's turn to hymn number 160 and sing Just When I Need Him Most. And what a great reply this is to the scripture that says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And just when we need him, he's always there. So let us sing together. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most. 
Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Just when I need him, Jesus is true. Never forsaking all the way through, giving for burdens, pleasures anew. Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long. For all my sorrow, giving a song, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. At this time, we are privileged to have Chris Strickland back with us today. As you, I might have said before, Chris is a, a student up at AU University and also is a firefighter in Columbia County. But uh, most of all, he enjoys uh, singing God's praises. So, Chris, Blessed Assurance is a great song for this morning. Yes, sir, it is. Thank you. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Perfect. 
perfect submission all is at rest I am my Savior and happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my Savior my story this is my song crazy my savior all the day long scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Paul writes, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, this passage made me think of a wake-up call, and I was wondering, have you ever had a wake-up call? Now, I'm not talking about the wake-up call you usually receive in maybe like a hotel, let's say. You know, when you stay at a hotel, you call the front desk and you tell them, call me at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, so you'll wake up, you know, when you get the phone call. That is a wake-up call, but that's not the one I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about an experience that changes the way you see life and live life. Uh, some of you may, may have experienced a health wake-up call. Uh, you know, maybe you went in for a doctor's appointment or you weren't feeling quite right and the doctor ran some tests for you and then maybe sat you down and said, you know, based on the test results, it looks like you have you know, diabetes or cancer or heart disease or some other problem. And maybe that was your wake-up call. And that really changed the way you saw life, lived life as it related to your health. And maybe it, it affected what you began to eat and how you exercise and different things like that and so that's what a wake-up call is it's something that changes the way you view and live life and the reason it's called a wake-up call is because before that moment you were in a state of slumber uh, you were kind of in sleep mode as it related to whatever it may have been that uh, you were challenged with and so when you were hit with that wake-up call that alarm that went off and really got your attention uh, it just changed you. It changed the way you saw life and lived life. Well, just like you may have, may have had a health wake-up call, uh, there are also spiritual wake-up calls. And listen to what Paul says in verse 11. He says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Now, he here's what I want you to know. Paul is writing to Christians. Okay, he's writing to Christians and some of these Christians, he's assuming that some of these Christians are spiritually asleep. Even though they know Christ, they are spiritually asleep and he wants to wake them up. Now, if there were some Christians in Rome in the first century that were spiritually sleeping, then there are probably some Christians even here today listening to this service. And maybe you're one of them that maybe you're spiritually sleeping. 
and maybe you need a wake-up call this morning. So here's what I want to do this morning. First of all, I want to help you determine if you are spiritually asleep. Second, I want to give you a wake-up call. And then third, I want to describe to you what it looks like for a Christian to be awake. Okay? And so let's, let's first start by figuring out if you are spiritually sleeping. Now, at first glance, you may think, well, Ron, uh, it's pretty easy to know if someone's sleeping or not. I know if I'm sleeping or not. And that's usually true. Uh, but not always. Sometimes you can unintentionally drift into sleep mode. I remember driving back uh, from Dothan, Alabama uh, one time. And I was, I was driving down a back road. Actually, I was driving down the interstate this time. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm asleep driving my car. And I wake up and I'm going about 100. And I just, I didn't mean to go to sleep. I didn't even... No, I was asleep until something woke me up. And uh, this happened also in a different scenario where I was, I was staying with some people in a hotel in New York City. And uh, we were all sitting in the hotel room and then one person, and I'm not gonna name names, but one person started snoring real loud, okay? Just super loud. And so several of us look at him and tell him, yeah, we, you need to stop snoring. You're snoring so loud, and it's not even time to go to sleep yet. But your your snoring is way too loud. And when he kind of, you know, woke up just enough to start talking, he said, uh, "How can I be snoring when I'm not even sleeping?" And obviously, we all laughed because obviously he was sleeping. He just didn't realize it, right? And so it is possible to kind of unintentionally drift into that sleep mode. And, uh, and I think this is what Paul's saying. You know, you may know Christ, but you may have drifted into this sleep mode and you need to be uh, woke up. And so, you know, just like snoring is a good indicator that you are asleep, uh, there are some indicators as well that tell you if you are spiritually sleeping. And Paul gives us those indicators here in this passage. Listen to verse 13. Listen to what he says. He says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. So how do you know if you are spiritually asleep? Well, just look at your life. Look at your life and ask yourself if one or more of these pairs of characteristics that Paul gives describes your life. The first pair is orgies and drunkenness. You know, simply put, this pair involves, uh, you know, drinking too much, having too much to drink, and disturbing those around you. And this displays, obviously, a lack of self-control and a lack of concern and love for those around you. If that's what your life looks like on the weekends, then you are spiritually asleep, and you need to wake up. Or maybe this next pair describes your life. The second pair is sexual immorality and sensuality. Simply put, this pair involves pursuing a sex life apart from God's design and having no shame for your sin. And having no shame for your sin just simply means, you know, you don't care. Uh, you feel like you can do whatever you want. You don't even care if it goes public. You're not concerned about your reputation. You're not concerned about the reputation of the church. You're not even concerned about the reputation of Jesus, even though you call yourself a Christian. There's no shame in that. And so if that's true of you, if that's your life, uh, then you are spiritually asleep and you need to wake up. The third pair that Paul gives is quarreling and jealousy. Simply put, you know, your life is all about you. You know, you cannot be happy when someone else is happy or blessed. But yet you just kind of revert back to quarreling and being jealous of that person. Barclay said it this way, he says it's, it's the inability and unwillingness to take second place. You just can't stand for anyone to have more than you, uh, experience something better than you, uh, get in a position that you want. I mean, it just eats at you. Uh, and maybe that's you, if that is you, uh, you are spiritually asleep and you need to wake up. Now let me help you by giving you a wake-up call. And that's exactly what Paul does here in this passage in verses 11 and 12. Listen to what he says again. He says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. 
For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now there are, there are three phrases that really stand out to me in these few verses. They are, when Paul says, you know the time, he says, the hour has come, and then he says, the day is at hand. You know, you know the time, the hour has come, the day is at hand. These phrases are meant to ring loudly in your minds to wake you up to the fact that our time that we have left before either Jesus meets us or we meet Jesus, that time is short. And so this should be like an alarm ringing in our minds that we need to make the most of the time. Time is short. We need to make the most of life. Now you may say, well, Ron, that's exactly why I'm trying to stay asleep is because I want to make the most of the life. I'm going to keep doing the deeds of the darkness because I don't have much life left. Who knows when I'll go? You know, let's make the most of life. If that's what you think, then you are failing to understand what life is truly all about and how to make the most of life. You are failing to understand that. Jesus tells us in John 10:10, 10, 10, he says, I have come to give you life and give it to the full. You know, Jesus came to give you real life, the way God meant for you to experience life. And the only way to do that is to wake up, cast off the deeds of the darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So time is short, and Paul tells us that salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And what that simply means is that, you know, when we placed our faith in Christ, whenever that was for you, uh, you are closer today to meeting Jesus face to face than you were then. Either he's going to come to you or you're going to go to him. But that time is getting shorter. And here's the thing, and you know this to be true. Time doesn't stop just because you're sleeping. Time keeps marching on. And so we need to wake up. We need to wake up and live for Christ. And so what does that look like? Well, that brings me to my final point. I want to describe to you what it looks like for a Christian to be awake. You know, when you go to sleep at night, you probably take off the clothes that you were wearing during the day and you put on some form of pajamas, okay? Whatever that may be. Uh, so there are certain clothes that you sleep in, okay? And when you're spiritually sleeping, Paul tells us there are certain clothes that we sleep in. He calls them the deeds of the darkness. So we just talked about those, those three pairs of clothing that we just looked at. So hopefully though, you are awake now and you're looking at your wardrobe and you're wondering what, what you're wearing and why are you wearing it? Should you be wearing what you're wearing? And so now you have the opportunity, if you are awake and looking to Christ, you have the opportunity to change clothes, okay? You have the opportunity to cast off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. You have the opportunity to take off those pajamas and get dressed for the life that God has for you. Now I wonder, how many of us are awake enough to realize that we should be getting dressed for the day instead of staying dressed for the night? You know, I was thinking about this idea of, you know, uh, dressing for the night, dressing for the day. And it's just an interesting time we're in with the, these, these nation, almost a nationwide shutdown. At least many states are, are shutting down. Uh, Stay-at-home orders in place. And so that just changes how people do things. And uh, I read the other day that there's a, there's a, um, uh, a town in Maryland called Tannytown. Okay, Tannytown, it says the Tannytown police are reminding residents to wear pants when checking their mailbox. In a Facebook post, the police said, please remember to put pants on before leaving the house to check your mailbox. And then they said this, you know who you are, this is your final warning. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of funny, I guess, unless you live in Tannytown and you're a neighbor to this person, whoever this person is, but you know, most of us know that when you wake up to leave the house, you need to put your pants on. I mean, you need to get dressed for the day. But I wonder, 
you know, how many of us are thinking when we start out our day, I need to put on Christ. I need to put on Christ. I want to live for Christ today. Paul says it this way. He says that we ought to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So what does that mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul tells us that for many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so on the one hand, to put on Christ means to become a Christian. It means to be identified with Christ. And, and that may be where some of you are this morning that you know, you're not spiritually asleep. You're spiritually dead to God. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that apart from Christ, we are dead in our sin, dead to God. And it's only by placing our faith in Jesus that we can be made alive to God. And so maybe that's where you are this morning. You need to put on Christ for the first time. You need to place your faith in Christ. Turn from your sin and turn to Christ for forgiveness. Give your life to Him. And when you do that, the Bible says that you move from death to life. And so that may be where you are. And that's what Paul's talking about here in Galatians 3. So in one sense, when we put on Christ, it could talk about when we first come to faith in Christ. But on the other hand, Paul expands that concept here in Romans 13 to mean not only initially coming to faith in Christ, but also living out our faith in Christ day in and day out, moment by moment. So we need to be intentional in our lives by putting on Christ moment by moment. A gentleman named Ray Steadman said it this way. He gives this illustration. He says, when I get up in the morning, I put on my clothes, intending them to be part of me all day to go where I go and do what I do. And I'm, hopefully you can relate to that. He says, they cover me and make me presentable to others. Th that is the purpose of clothes. In the same way, the apostle is saying to us, Put on Jesus Christ when you get up in the morning. Make him a part of your life that day. Intend that he go with you everywhere you go and that he act through you in everything that you do. Call upon his resources and live your life in Christ. So instead of you know, filling your life with alcohol or some addictive substance and disturbing the peace, you know, let us be filled with the Spirit of God and pursue peace. You know, instead of trying to pursue pleasure outside of God's design and having no shame for our sin, let us pursue pleasure according to God's design and see sin for what it is. Instead of quarreling and being jealous, let us rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep and love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is what it looks like to cast off the deeds of darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day, moment by moment. You're to live life the way God wants you to live is what it looks like for Christians to be awake and to be putting on Christ each and every day. And so if you are spiritually asleep, then the sooner you wake up, the better. Uh, because every day is filled with great opportunity to live for Christ and to experience life the way God wants you to experience it. So here's the question. You know, what, what will it take for you to wake up? What will it take for you to wake from your spiritual slumber and put on the Lord Jesus Christ even today? I hope you'll consider this message even, this service, as a spiritual wake-up call to you to put on Christ so you don't oversleep and find yourself improperly clothed when you meet Christ face to face. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this word from Paul that just shakes us up, makes alarms go off because he wants to wake us up. God, you want to wake us up and see who you are, to, to realize what you've done for us in Jesus, 
and to live out that truth each and every day. God, I pray for everyone listening right now. Wherever they may be with you, maybe they need to give their life to you for the first time. God, I pray that they would turn from sin, turn from a life that is being built on something other than you, and I pray they would embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they would put on Christ for the first time. And for all of us who know Jesus, I pray that we would not easily fall asleep, but that we would stay awake, awake to your leading, awake to the opportunities to glorify you, to represent you, to live for you. Help us to stay awake, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us sing our final hymn together. As we sing together, let us remember that that renewal of the Holy Spirit comes through Jesus Christ himself. And without him, we can do nothing. So let us sing this great hymn together. worshiping with us this morning. Uh, I want to encourage you again, if this is your first time worshiping with us, text the word Hill Guest to 313131 uh, or sign up. Also, well, sign up for our emails too. And so you can get updates, how you can join us throughout the week as we learn together and grow together and stay awake together uh, for all that God has for us. And uh, also how you can give and continue to invest in the mission. Uh, you can mail your offering, drop it off in the drop box, give online, uh, and again, just to update you, we're going to have a date for you soon that we're going to be moving toward in our reopening. But in the meantime, pray for us as we continue to uh, discern those details. But again, thank you for worshiping with us. And let me give this as our benediction. Remember, God has given us a mission to make disciples of all the nations. And so as we leave this service, let us do so in the power of God's spirit. And let us stay awake to the opportunities to represent Christ well to our city. Amen.